Our guest is Frederica de Laguna, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at Bryn Mawr College and a visiting lecturer at the Burke Museum and the University of Washington. As ancient people have modern civilization thrust upon them, is anthropology dying out? Is it a dying field? I don't believe so. No, because uh, there are many anthropologists now who are in uh, positions that I would call applied anthropology. In other words, they utilize their skills of studying society in order to advise corporations to, uh, and of course, they should, more of them should be employed by the State Department to, mm. and also at the White House, I believe, to advise about the foreign countries with which we deal and to explain to those who must do the dealing what are the effective methods of approach. So the nature of anthropology has changed over time. Oh, of course it has. It's a, Bound, but so is the nature of all disciplines, all sciences, has changed over time. How would you define anthropology? Oh, I would rather not. <laughs> I don't think that, uh, I would rather do anthropology than define it. As part of the problem, anthropology is such a wide and diverse field. Uh, take, for example, ethnology. Is that the same thing as anthropology? No, it is not. Anthropology is a wider discipline that embraces ethnography, the study of living peoples, archaeology, the study of the past, linguistics, the study of languages, and physical anthropology, the study of human biology. So anthropology is the glue that binds a lot of fields together. Yes, it does. As uh, Tyler wrote in, his, in, I think it was 1888, in the introduction to his uh, volume on anthropology, a very small little textbook that uh, one could see in the mountains of Switzerland, men staggering, men climbing with heavy loads on their backs. And yet, in addition to the load, there was a carrying frame. And this made it easier to carry and hold together the loads. So anthropology is a generalizing uh, discipline that, does, that includes everything human not as a specialty, but as, uh, and the anthropology, but as uh, gives a general perspective. And I deplore the recent trends in anthropology of splitting up into specialties, because that's mm. losing the broad vision. Do you have to have a particular type of personality to have that broad vision to be a good anthropologist? To be a field anthropologist, I think you do. I have taught in a department or I did teach in a department of sociology and anthropology. And there is a difference in temperament. And um, we finally, at Bryn Mawr College, obtained the divorce, as I always called it, our divorce from sociology. Mm -hmm. And then, as the uh, dean had predicted, the mm -hmm. registration in both departments doubled so that we actually had four times as many students as we had had when it was a joint department. That's and I think, but what the difference in, in um, personality is, mm -hmm. I think the sociologist is more at home with uh, figures, statistics, questionnaires, just as a historian is more at home with mm -hmm. um, printed and written records. And the, the anthropologist? The anthropologist is at home talking as we are talking face to face. When you first visited Greenland in 1929 and Alaska in 1930, what was it like? Did field work turn out to be just like the books predicted? The books never described field work. That was one of the interesting things. As graduate students at Columbia, we were always agog, wondering what it would be like when we went to the field. That was the real world. Yes. But um, as it, from, from the time that I was a little girl, I had been crazy to go to the Arctic and meet the Eskimos, so that when I went to Greenland, I knew this was going to be a wonderful adventure and that everything would be extraordinary and uh, fulfilling. Was it? It was. It was. I found it. All the strange foods. And I remember one night in the uh, tent, there was a storm, and uh, the, it was high tide. We were, our tents, we're right on the edge of the um, 
of the tide line. Uh, and the men were up trying to, uh, to hold down the tents by putting in heavier boulders. The ground was frozen, and so they, it wasn't a question of driving in uh, the tent pegs more deeply. It was a question of putting in more boulders. And I had um, eaten something which had disagreed with me, so I wasn't well. And I thought to myself, here I am that with, a, with this uh, storm raging, the tent probably going to collapse. I'll be, I'll be all wet through. If, if I could wish myself back in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, would I want to go? No. That's fantastic. Yeah. Let's change the subject for a bit. How do you put a group of people under an anthropological microscope and still treat them as equals? You are one person and they are another person. I think that's one, that may be one difference between uh, sociologists and anthropologists. Uh, Talcott Parsons, for example, used to write about ego and altar. I am ego, you're only altar. But the anthropologist, I am one self and you are another self. And we deal with each other as selves. So there's no putting of people under microscopes. Were you trained that way at Columbia, or did you have to learn that in the field? Frankly, I don't know. I can't answer that question. It's a good one. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was a bit of both, naturally. I mean, one could be told something, but you have to put it into practice. Put it another way, has your attitude towards people changed over time? Uh, as you've matured, do you begin to approach people differently? I think I have less, um, at least I hope I have less racial prejudice than I could, mm -hmm. than uh, I used to have. You specialized in studying the indigenous Alaskan people called the Clinkets. Why that particular group? I had started out doing archaeology in um, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, and on the Yukon. And although I didn't find a great deal on the Yukon, I became interested in the resemblances between the things, uh, the cultures which should of the Alaskan Northwest and uh, those of the Coast Salish area, particularly the finds at uh, Marpole, Eburn, at, the, at what is now part of Greater Vancouver. And um, if there was to be any connection, any transfer of techniques, ideas, of what we would call traits, it must have been across the Gulf of Alaska. And the only decent harbor in that long stretch is Yakutat Bay. So I wanted to go to Yakutat, and I wanted to study the Tlingit to try to bridge this gap. I went in uh, 49 after the war to see if I could find an area where there was an ongoing uh, native community that um, not just a bunch of, of natives living in a city like Juneau or in Seattle, but in a, in a community which was their own and at the same time had sites that would be mm -hmm. worth digging. Was that hard to find? Yes, I, I tried three areas. Uh, great disappointment at, um, in the Chilkat area, partly because of the suspicion with which whites were viewed, and partly because I couldn't find a site. <laughs> so there were the two. We did find, I had two young fellows with me as assistants. Uh, we did find sites in the Angoon area on Admiralty Island, and we worked there for one season, trying out how to do ethnography and archaeology at the same time. You understand there's always a choice that you have to make of time. So when we went back, I had uh, two young men who were doing most of the digging, and uh, Catherine McClellan, my colleague, former student but a colleague now, and myself were doing the ethnography, and from time to time we would go out and visit the site. And that same pattern was followed in the summer of 52 when we went to Yakutat. And then, because I wanted to um, uh, be there during the winter, 
and experience what it was like in the mm -hmm. winter, I returned to do simply ethnography it, uh, two years later. And when the Clinkets first met you, what did they think of you? I met the first one at Wrangell, Alaska, and I almost brought, showed a slide. I was eager to meet them and to know them, and my brother took a picture of me kneeling on the dock at Wrangell talking with an old lady who was selling baskets. They were, I didn't have any trouble. They were, I was friendly. How do you meet strangers? But did they think it was strange that somebody came to study them? Did you have to earn their trust, for example, before they would open up to you? Yes. At uh, Yakutat, there was one old woman who asked me if I was Russian. You see, they still remember the Russian days, when, and uh, they were afraid of Russian spies. But she was very soon disabused of that by her friends, and uh, there was no, no problem there. Was it easier for the women to accept you than the men? I didn't notice any difference. The uh, leading man at Yakutat, he was very, very busy. I didn't see nearly as much of him as I should have liked. But one day he, he came and he spent the entire day with us. And uh, I got 70 typed pages of information from what he, had, what he had managed to tell us that day. So I didn't find any, any reservation there. No, I really didn't. I had expected, when Kitty and I went to the interior, which we did after being in Yakutat, in order to track down the uh, tradition of one of the clans, my clan, incidentally, who, um, whose ancestors had come from the Copper River, we expected to find um, the withdrawn, encapsulated Athabascans, but they weren't. Not at all. They were. They were really friendly, too. Tell us a bit about the Clinkets. Before the appearance of white fishermen into their society, how was their economy organized? It was organized, really, according to households. And these were, uh, these were multifamily households. The, there would be a head of the house, <clears throat> the owner of the house, as they would say in Clinket. And uh, then, uh, the other heads of families would be his brothers or possibly his married nephews, plus their married-in wives, either from the other uh, major half of the village, kinship half or moiety, as we'd say, or from uh, the other moiety in another village. And <clears throat> a number of the uh, undertakings were undertaken by the entire household or even by a group of houses of the same clan under the leadership of the uh, leading house owner. So there, there might be a, a, a weir and a fish trap, uh, as there was uh, near uh, Yakutat. And um, this would be built by the men of that household. And then when the fish were, had run up above the weir, Everybody would get into the water and drive the fish down into the trap. The women of the household, uh, the men would carry up the fish, and the women would cut the fish for uh, drying and smoking. That was a highly skilled task. Uh, each woman would make her mark on her fish in cutting, so that when the bundles of fish were tied up and put in the cache, her fish would be uh, recognized. How were the children raised? At what point did they have to take on adult activities? Well, they, uh, they were eager to grow up, as our, as our children are. And um, a little boy would usually be turned over in the old days to his mother's brother, who was considered a better teacher and better disciplinarian than his own father. And certainly, he would have to learn the traditions of his uh, matrilineal line so that it would be his mother's brother who would be in, instruct him in that, and also in hunting, and, and, in all the, and in all the religious observances that accompanied hunting. The uh, girl would remain in her father's house until she married, unless it was what they called a royal marriage, and her husband was the nephew of her father. 
and moved into the house. And then she never had to move from that house. She would be marrying, do you see, someone who stood in the relationship of cross cousin to her, her father's sister's son, or someone in that category. Did this reflect economic necessity, this very complex marriage relationship? It's a very good question. I made an excursion into um, writing on social organization and um, really taking, taking a, 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 the, a cue from Catherine McClellan was arguing that it was probably the ownership and control of food supplies, which are in the hands of women, which may have, have resulted in the matrilineal inheritance among Haida, Simshan, Tlingit, and the Western Athabascans. Is there a concept of love within Tlingit society? You would suppose so if you read the, if you uh, heard the words to their, uh, to their songs. They're, they're couched in terms of uh, romantic love. I, I don't think they had a word, love, and I don't think they met, I don't think they went in for marriages, r romantic marriages. They were more practical. Most, most of the marriages would be arranged. Margaret Mead once told me in an interview that many of the peoples that she studied had no word or concept equivalent to our happiness. Did the Klingit people have a concept or a word similar to our term happiness? What an extraordinary question. I don't know. It's not one that I ever investigated. I was not interested in in getting translations of English words into Tlingit or into Athabascan. I was interested in Tlingit concepts and Tlingit and Athabascan concepts. And one wouldn't start to study that by imposing outside categories. One would listen to what they had to say and then ask them to enlarge on their categories. The point you raise about how we study people is, is an interesting one, and I'll get back to it in a moment. But I want to ask something else about the Tlingits. Were they very successful at warfare? Could they defend themselves well? And did they take slaves? Certainly. Certainly they did. And what were the oh. role of slaves? Uh, quite interesting. They, um, their lives uh, were very much like that of poorer members of the family, except that they could be uh, sold or given away. And at certain times, at memorial potlatches, for example, at deaths and at memorial potlatches, uh, slaves might be killed to accompany their uh, master or mistress. But one of my informants, a, um, a woman who had been born in 1884, said that um, there was a little slave girl in, in her family, and she supposed, a, a young woman, I guess, uh, she supposed that it was one of her uh, aunts, that is, her, one of her father's sisters, or someone in that category. And it wasn't later in, in, that she learned that that was a slave, slave woman. And over your lifetime, how has the society of the Clinkets changed? Have you seen changes from the very first time that you were there? I was there in 49, 50. Yes, indeed, indeed there have been changes. Um, but what are they? Let me put it another way. Take changes in technology, such as motors. Has that undercut the culture? No, I think they've, I think they've adapted what we had to give to what they wanted. Uh, they are, um, they are sh they've always been a shrewd, uh, successful people. And um, when, so when it came to running gas boats with uh, Loran uh, or radar, they were, I don't know whether they had radar, but in any case, with, with, uh, with uh, other things, they manage that very well. I think their only problem has been with the way in which the um, Land Settlement Act has been set up. It's been set up in such a way that uh, their native corporations have got to be money-making, uh, not simply self-supporting, but but making a profit and, and paying taxes. And I'm very much afraid that in a number of cases, it will be impossible for, for these native peoples to 
and that they will lose their lands. And I think this was a scheme uh, really put in by, uh, written into the bill by uh, white real estate operators who simply can't wait to get their hands on non-native lands. In that sense, they were unequal. Yes, in that sense, yeah. But as far as, as uh, making use of white culture, or Western culture, let's say, American culture, and gadgets, <laughs> they, they do it just as well as, as uh, anyone. Or as badly as we As do. badly as anyone. I want to get back to a point that you talked about earlier, the difficulty of adapting or correlating the words love and happiness to another culture. Is it a difficult problem for anyone in any particular culture to really understand another culture? Or do we always try to relate to it using words that are bandied about in our own culture? Uh, one has to become a translator <coughs> of the uh, foreign culture into terms which one's own culture can understand. One's own, and, and as you know, a complete translation is never possible. So there'll be explanations in addition to the translation. But I've said before, and I'll say it again, the closer you come into understanding and looking into the face of the uh, stranger, the more you see your own reflected there. I want to change the subject a bit to your personal life. Your parents were both professors of philosophy. Was that a blessing or was that a curse? Oh, no, I think it, um, I, I think I gained a great deal uh, from, uh, from both parents. Did they give you a standard that was difficult to live up to? My father did. He was very much, he was um, very much concerned about uh, my progress in school and in college. And, um, Did you resent it at the time? No, I didn't. No, I didn't, because he was helpful. I think, uh, I think I wanted to be more independent. But indeed, I was, you see, when I became a graduate student. And as for my mother, we became uh, intellectual companions. And she became interested in anthropology and utilized uh, anthropological uh, points of view from both uh, A. Irving Hallowell, Pete Hallowell of the University of Pennsylvania, who became a very good friend of ours, and his uh, wife, uh, Maud, who had been formerly a student of my mother's and who was responsible for bringing uh, Pete and mother together. Now, I knew uh, Hallowell from my associations with the University of Pennsylvania Museum. He was teaching at the university. But some of our, we used to have wonderful discussions, the four, the four of us. And in her later writing, she made, uh, she made use of anthropological points of view, just as she had made use of uh, psychological points of view in her earliest work. So neither of your parents were bothered by the fact that you did not go into philosophy? No, they didn't want me to. My father was the one who, who suggested anthropology for me as uh, something that would satisfy my love of the outdoors and uh, camping. And he himself had had the experience of being a school teacher in the first group of school teachers that went to the Philippines after the insurrection. And uh, this experience for him of being for two years in, in an area of uh, strange people whose language he had to learn, he didn't want to repeat it. But he thought that it, was, um, that it was a wonderful experience, a broadening experience. So uh, he was all, all, he was the one who suggested anthropology to me. And then I took to it like a duck to water. It's common for people at 80 to take life easy, but you're still hard at work. Oh, certainly, yes. I hope I can keep at it until the end. Why? Because that's my life. As Paul Simon, the songwriter, has said, still crazy after all these years. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> still enjoying it. Frederica de Laguna, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at Bryn Mawr College and a visiting lecturer at the Burke Museum and the University of Washington. Upon reflection. <laughs>
Upon Reflection is made possible by Rainier Bank and by the University Bookstore, now serving the East Side as well as the University community.